wife. Good evening, everybody. And welcome to God's house on this uh, Thanksgiving Eve. I just want to share with you, I'm glad I'm here today. Uh, last night I got caught on the 118 in that SIG alert. And then I went home, I didn't get home till about seven o'clock, but then I had, a, the, it cleared. But driving on the freeway in Southern California at, in, when it's dark and the wind is blowing and the rain is coming down and there are idiots all over you, you know? They have to go 70 even in the rain. And I just, I, I was praying the whole way that I get home. So I want to just thank you, Lord, for keeping me here. All right, amen. So take out your uh, worship folder, and tonight we are celebrating the feast or the festival of Thanksgiving. Our theme is Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. And uh, we're going to begin with hymn number 495. If you take out your hymn books and let us stand for this opening hymn. Uh, take your worship folder and we'll use the opening verses on trust. Okay. We begin our time together this day in the name of the God who provides for all of our needs. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Not fret. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Jesus says, Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. 
You are worth more than many sparrows. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Present your request to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. So humble yourselves, therefore, before the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. All grace, who has called us to his eternal glory in Christ, after we have suffered a little while, will himself restore us and make us strong firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever, as we now join our voices, sing and pray. We sing the hymn. Let us pray. Dear Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we gather together on this night before Thanksgiving. And dear Lord, we thank you this night for the blessings you have showered upon this country since its beginning many years ago. We thank you, dear Lord, that those people who came here, many of them, loved you and honored you and set aside a time to give thanks. Dear Father, we too set aside a time to give you thanks. We give you thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. Bless our time together this night. Fill us with your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take time to greet those around you this evening.
Before you, before you get, before you get in trouble, have a seat. All right, take out your Bibles, would you please? And uh, turn to page. What page are we on? 1830. Page 1830. All right, page 1830, and there you will find Philippians chapter four. All right, I'll give you a minute to get there. Page 1830. All right. I'm going to have you guys start with verse 4. And uh, you can do the first paragraph, and I will do the second, if that's okay with you. So please begin. Rejoice. So finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, and whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, you think about such things. For whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of our Lord. Now turn to Matthew chapter 6, page 1505. Matthew chapter 6. All right. And we're going to start with verse 25. Everybody there? I want you to look at the preceding section before we read it. This is, of course, what is this sermon here? Come on, what is it? Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus' Sermon on the Mount that starts in chapter 4. And if you look, he goes on various topics, okay? Um, such as, like, turn the other cheek. That wasn't popular, okay? Uh, what's the other one? Turn the other cheek and pray for your enemies. That wasn't popular in those days, all right? In this section, look at verse 19. Here he starts, begins to teach about the, the things of this world, wealth and possessions, and how God's people and how we are to deal with them and think about them, okay? So, just a note. Um, you have much anxiety and worry in your life? 
That's too bad. You shouldn't. By the way, the word worry or anxiety is used six times in these verses. So the point of this whole section is, how do we live with anxiety or worry in our life? By the way, some people, I checked this out, some people would say we are living in the age of anxiety. Has anybody heard that? Living in the age of anxiety. Isn't that amazing? We have more than the generations before us, and as Americans, we probably have more than anybody, most people in the world, right? And we're living in an age of anxiety and worry. So that's our topic for this night. And um, why don't I begin? And I'm going to have you join me, okay? Verse 25, do not worry. By the way, notice the, la the previous verse. You cannot serve both God and money. We need to learn that. Let me read. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Okay? Don't put your Bibles away. Let's go through this. Okay? So our verses begin with the response to the last verse, you can't serve God and money. So first of all, Jesus says, do not worry, or better yet, I think, do not be anxious. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. And later on, we're going to come to what we wear. He uses the word worry anxious six times. Now, Jesus here is not talking about a rule of poverty. And you know, there are some still in the church who think it's so good to live under the vow of poverty, which is nothing wrong with that. But God, Jesus isn't telling us that we all have to live in poverty with nothing. It's not that the things of this world are necessarily evil but they can become evil in our lives if they begin to control us, okay? The point is, life is more than food and clothing. Now, Jesus gives two examples. What's the first example? The birds, okay? The birds. You know what Luther said this? He said, the birds are excellent preachers. He must have had a couple of beers that night. The birds are excellent preachers. You know why? I thought this was great. They are excellent preachers because they show us how they depend on Almighty God to provide for their needs. Seriously. By the way, I just saw the other day that God was throwing seed or food into the bird's nests around our house. Have you seen that? It's not true at all. God doesn't throw food into the bird's nest, does he? What do they have to do? They have to get out and find food. And God provides it out there in whatever, wherever they search. We have tons of birds that are out here feeding off of our weeds. We have so many weeds, they love this. I think they're encamping out here during the day. But anyway, God provides. That's the lesson. God doesn't throw, they don't have a container where they store all their food in their nest. God provides every day, but what do they have to do? Get out there and work. That is a primary lesson, okay? He doesn't, the things of this world, okay. We have to get out there and support ourselves. Worrying about it won't make you live longer. Now let's go to the next group, okay? Now we have the second example. Verse 28, join me please. We're not going all the way through. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So, do not worry, say, 
what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. We're going to stop there. Don't go ahead. So the second example is the lilies of the field, the plants that grow. And he says, they come up every year. With that, they, don't, they don't need much. They come up on their own. And then he uses the example of Solomon. See that? Look at verse 29. Solomon in all his glow splendor was not as wonderful as these. The grass and the, and the plants grow on their own. And by the way, if you notice, it is, they are thrown into the fire. You know why that's in there? Because that's what most people in Jesus' day used for fuel in the fire, in the furnace, in their home to cook their food. They would pull the grass and other things out in the field, and they would use that to burn. Probably would too, but that was used, okay? So the point here is God knows we need things, all right? And he does provide in ways often beyond our understanding. I want to take a sidebar here before we move on. How many of you have had an experience in your life where you didn't know how you were going to make it? Hang on. Financially and have enough to live on and you really didn't know how in the world. How, let's see it now. How many hands have experienced that? You have. Good. You remember it? How often do you remind yourself of it? Not that often. I think it's good to remind ourselves. I have to tell you, 50 years ago, Debbie and I were newly married, and we were living in the ghetto in St. Louis. Debbie was making 400 bucks a, a month as a teacher. We had a car payment. We were paying off her student loan. We had to pay rent. I had my education at the seminary. I was at the seminary. And I'm going to tell you, we would sit and wonder, how are we going to make it through the rest of this month? Ever been there? Huh? If you haven't, I feel sorry for you. Because you know what it does? It makes you pray and say, Lord, please help us. And I'm going to tell you, you know what happened? I cannot remember a time when we did not have what we needed to make it through. Something would come in the mail. So a check from someone or whatever or I don't know, I don't know how it came. And I look back at that, and that was such a powerful thing because it taught me a lesson, and Deborah a lesson, what? What was the lesson? You, well, the first lesson is you do the best you can, right? And we're going to talk about that. You got to work, like the birds. You got to work. But you can't always make it ends meet. And how powerful it is to be able to say, Lord, help me. Now, if it wouldn't have come, I don't know what we would have done. I guess we would have gone on, right? Those are powerful experiences. All right, now, let's move on. The next verses. Here comes the main part. This is the, this is the, what I call on the path of the kingdom of God, to be on the path of the kingdom of God. Let's read it. Hopefully you've memorized this. Verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Okay? So let's keep your Bibles open. Notice, seek ye first the kingdom of God. The emphasis there is to keep seeking. It's not seek and stop. It's not like, oh yeah, I'm seeking. I sought him. Now I got it. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. No, 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 no. This is an ongoing process where you and I are to continually seek the kingdom of God and the power and presence of God in our lives to learn about him and to seek his kingdom on a greater level level. And I'm afraid that is something that doesn't happen a lot in people's lives. As one person said, we need to keep planning. I like the word planning, because I'm going to come back to that. 
We need to keep planning your Christian life. Now, I want to say to you, and I don't blow me off here. Are you, how much are you planning your Christian life? And I got to say, from some of us, it may be very little, whenever it's convenient. How are you planning? How are you seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Or are you just blowing it off? If you're blowing it off now, guess what? You're probably blowing it off other times too. And the reality is, you, you and I as, a, I, as a believer, I need to keep seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his ways, his will, his wisdom, how God thinks and how God acts. If I only pick the things of God up once in a while when I want something, I'm not seeking. I'm just blowing them off. And I think that happens in our, all of our lives at times. But I think if we get in that rut and, and Christianity, does, our journey doesn't mean much. Oh, yeah, I go to church, but that's it. So let me say that to you, first thing. So I, I want to say to you, live a life of thanksgiving. Is that on the board? Live a life of thanksgiving. Say that with me. Live a life of thanksgiving. That's important. That's part of planning, seeking on a continual basis because you are living a life of thanksgiving. And I want to give you the gospel. Where does living a life of thanksgiving begin? Anybody? With the Lord? No, not with prayer. With the Lord Jesus Christ. It begins with Jesus. That's where our living a life of thanksgiving begins. We become thankful for our Lord Christ, that he is my Savior. He died for me. He rose for me. He paid for my sins through his sacrifice on the cross. And I think I've been preaching this for a long time, and I never did so much. But that personal relationship with Jesus has to be personal. It isn't just out there. It isn't theoretical. It's you. You as a human being, me as a human being, that I have live a life of thanksgiving because I'm connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are connected to Christ, then the path of thanksgiving will follow. All right, let's move on. Third part. So how do we now live? How does this text teach us how to live? I got a few things. I want to talk about planning. Isn't planning an important part of your life? Anybody planning today for something? Okay. All right. Planning. We plan for the future. You know when you started to plan? You didn't even know it. Your parents kicked you out of the house and sent you off to school. Going to school, kindergarten, elementary, that was part of your planning for what? For your future, right? You had to learn how to what? Oh, come on. Read and write and arithmetic and learn some English, right? You had to learn how to function in this world. That was part of the planning, your planning to live into the future. If your parents didn't force you to go to school, that wouldn't have been a good thing because you, weren't, you wouldn't be planning for the future, you would have been in big trouble. The second area, I got a few areas here. So the first is schooling. You have to learn, that's part of our planning, right? The second is, and you teachers know that, and think about all the students who don't wanna learn. Anyway, let's move on. The second one is a job. Remember when you got, well you didn't get kicked out maybe, but when your father told you, you need to find a job. Anybody remember that? Yeah, why did he tell you that? Because he wanted to get you out so you wouldn't be sitting around in the house doing nothing and getting in trouble with your friends down the street. You had to, be, you had to learn the skills of a job, right? You had to learn that you get a paycheck. You had to learn how to spend money. Boy, that was the other thing. You had to learn how to spend money by having a job, right? Your father or mother probably got tired of giving you money. That's a good thing. They got to learn. So the one thing is, so first is schooling, then getting a job, but then there's another level of, of, a, of, work, of education. And that is where you and I plan 
to learn the skill to do our job for life, right? You gotta, you gotta, if you, for those of you who have to be a teacher, you had to go to school to be a teacher, didn't you? You had to go student teaching. For those of you who are engineers, you had to go to school to be an engineer to learn how things work. How about musicians? You have to go and you have to practice, learn the scale, learn your skill. We, uh, we learn a skill for our life and work, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whatever it is. I got another one. How about health? You do any planning for your health? Of course you do. You got a doctor. You got a uh, what? You got appointments. You get a health checkup. They they, you know, that, by the way, I didn't do that for a number of years. Cliff Horn got on my case because I never went and saw a doctor. You know how that ended? How'd that end? With me having a heart attack because I had cholesterol in my system. I didn't watch what I was eating. Yeah, I wasn't planning. Health is a big way of planning, correct? Yes, and that's important. The last one I got is the future. Planning your future. How, you, how, how is it going to be when you stop working? How are you going to be? How's your future going to be later on in life? How are you going to live? We got a lot of people in trouble with that these days. Hopefully we plan for our future of retirement, okay? Whatever that's the kid. You go live with the kids, right? Isn't that your plan? Lord have mercy. All right. So let me finish this out. All of this is important, and it comes under the umbrella of seeking first the kingdom of God and the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So finally, I want to say to you, live a life of thanksgiving, okay? Live a life of thanksgiving. Plan your Christian life. Don't forget that. You're planning for other things. You're planning for next week and next year. But plan for your Christian life. And I got some categories for that. How about worship and prayer? How about Bible study? Some of you haven't been in Bible study in years, and I'm looking at you. You haven't been in Bible study for years. Why not? What are you waiting for? Huh? What are you waiting for? Bible study. How about service in the kingdom? Serving God in some way. That's part of our planning. That's part of seeking first the kingdom of God. By the way, when you get into serving others, that's a, that's a tough one, because you know what? Sometimes you don't like others, but you still have to serve them. Now you know how God feels about you and me. Yeah. So I want to say to you, see, keep seeking the kingdom of God. Don't be a lazy Christian. Can't live a life of thanksgiving and seek the kingdom. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do that purposely, mentally, willfully. And if you're just sitting back doing nothing in the kingdom of God, you need, a, you need a kick. And the Lord needs to move you and seek his will. Sorry to get all excited tonight. Jesus bless you. Amen. All right. We're going to continue with the offering of our gifts, and then we're going to sing the hymn for the night, In the Hour of Trial, hymn 511. Five eleven, please.
So in our prayers for today, I'm going to ask you to have, I'm going to give you private time to pray for your own journey of faith, that you may grow in that and that you may seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that's a personal thing. Please rise for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this Wednesday evening. And dear Lord, first of all, we thank you for the rain that has come our way these last days. Dear Lord, we thank you for the rain that has come off the Pacific and down this western coast. And dear Lord, we pray for more to come to replenish this dry land. We thank you, dear Lord, that you do hear and answer our prayers. And in sincerity of faith, we pray, dear Father, first of all, that you would continue to send us rain through this season of, of the fall and into the winter. Lord, in your mercy, Dear Lord, we pray this day also for those who are traveling this Thanksgiving and into the Christmas season, whether they're traveling here and locally or going overseas, dear Lord, protect them from all harm and danger. We thank you, dear Lord, for these holidays where we're able to get with family and friends and to celebrate these times together. Give us a good Thanksgiving tomorrow. But dear Lord, more importantly than that, Give to each of us a life of thanksgiving that doesn't just come one day a year, but comes every day, living our lives in thankfulness to you. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, dear Father, we do take time for private prayer and help each of us personally to take this time to pray, dear Lord, that each of us May continue, may continue to seek your kingdom and your righteousness. So hear us as we personally, privately pray. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, including ourselves, as together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take eat, this is my body. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you. And the peace of our Lord be with you always. Thank you. We continue with the sacrament. You may be seated. The body of Christ is given to you. The blood of Jesus. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ be part of your plan and your journey of faith, that you may live a life of thanksgiving.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit bless you this day and empower you to live a life of thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, a couple of announcements before we sing hymn 499. Uh, next Wednesday, we uh, begin um, Wednesday uh, dinner and devotion, 5.30 on Wednesday evening in the parish hall with devotion to follow in the parish hall. It's kind of a nice to get together and everything is there. And LWML will be serving. Uh, also, um, the angel tree is up. And this year, I think we have 23 children. We got some through the pantry, but then we got a, a, a half of them from the Pregnancy Resource Center. And guess what? They're all infants. They're all under the under the under a year old, less than a year. Some are three months old. So, on some of them, I wrote, I wrote. Uh, you, you follow the directions. You have to follow it carefully so we know who takes what. But anyway, I wrote at the bottom suggestions that they gave us that they for gifts. Okay, so you're welcome to take them, but you leave one. You put your name on both, and you leave. One copy here in the basket, and the other one you put on the on the gift. Okay. All right. Yes. Yes, and I you should probably not wrap them. Yes. Gift bags are okay because they need to open them. Correct. Thank you. All right. Uh, hymn number four ninety nine. Is the second same melody as the first. Let's stand to sing 499. <laughs> Good evening and be safe traveling home. Jesus bless you. <laughs>